Welcome to Ask a Physicist Anything. Sorry to interrupt, but okay. So a bit about my background. Uh, I grew up in rural Wisconsin in the 1980s, so I didn't have internet. I had books at the library. Due to the Reagan buildup, there were a lot of books on World War II technology, because of course we can't talk about the cool 1980s technology, because that's secret. So I actually know too much about how to design a battleship in 1940 that's completely irrelevant information, but it's fun. And being a budding nerd and scientist, I'm like, how do I test this because there's no way I'm going to get 50,000 tons of steel together in one place? Board games, so let's try that. Just set up a panel for next year and play it, battleship. Pretty much. Um, so, okay, board gaming, let's try that. Go off to college, there's a gaming society there. And that's when I got introduced to the whole rest of nerddom and fandom and geekdom and all of that awesome stuff. Um, after that, I went on to get a PhD in physics, which is why I think I'm justified in calling myself a physicist. Um, went on to be a college professor for three years. Got caught by the Great Recession. Did construction, including ditch digging for one day, uh, for 15 months. Uh, let's see, a lot of tutoring basically whatever I can find. I actually worked for MAGFest for 10 months as both their project and logistics manager, so I know how to drive a forklift and navigate a 26-foot box truck through Washington, D.C., which is an interesting skill to have, and I don't recommend acquiring it if you don't have to. Um, and, yeah, so part of my point on that is if you ask me about Superman, I know who he is. If you ask me about what did he do in comic number whatever, I'll be like, I don't know, show me. <laughs> so if you're asking something and I say, do you have a video clip of that? Please, I'm not being insulting, just that's where my background is. So, shoot. <laughs> like, literally, hit me with anything. Okay. What did you, uh, I guess, what, uh, what school did you teach at and what courses did you teach? Sure, okay, so I taught at a small liberal arts college in Albion, Michigan, called Albion College, because that's how creative we are. About 1,600 students. Since this is Michigan, I can do the hand thing. Yes. Dead center of I-94. Yes, so it's um, actually on the drug route between Chicago and Detroit. Um, <laughs> And the college is currently the largest employer in town because the foundry which used to supply parts to Detroit shut down. So it's an interesting place in both good and bad ways. Uh, courses I taught, I spent one year in the physics department where I taught the physics without calculus for pre-meds with all four lab sections, so that was fun. And then spring semester, uh, what was it? math for physics majors, a uh, bunch of labs, and I wound up doing most of the substitute teaching for electricity and magnetism because one of my three colleagues was going through a divorce and not handling it well. Um, then the next two years, I wound up in the math department because they went, hey, we know you can teach stuff, and we got a lot of Calc 1s. We know physicists can handle that. So <laughs> I wound up teaching a total of 10 sections of Calc 1, and got unusually good course evaluations, I guess. Um, one section of pre-calculus and one course of differential equations, which was super fun because Calc 1, by the time you have a PhD in physics, you can literally do it in your sleep. Differential equations hits that beautiful sweet spot of, okay, I have to actually pay attention to this, but, oh, it's 15 minutes till class, let me browse that real quick. Okay, ready to go. <laughs> and it works. Um, and then actually a couple years later, they came back and wanted me for one more semester, and then I taught physics for pre-meds again. Uh, and let me see, a couple of labs, because you always have those, and electricity and magnetism, which is a 300 level course, and that's when thing, so 100 level is the professor's board, 200 level is this is great, 300 level is, oh, I'd better write out a script because a minus sign will be fatal in like 10 minutes and I'll have no idea where it was because I already erased that part of the board. So that's what I've taught, and then a bunch of tutoring and some stuff at a for-profit college, but that's 
basically remedial high school. Because paying the rent is a thing you need to do. <laughs> Please, like, hit me with anything. I'll, I might just have to make something up, but I'll let you know that I'm doing that. So hit me with whatever fandom or real life physics question you have. <laughs> I have not, but that would actually be a very interesting Fermi problem. Have you heard of those? Um, my husband's an engineer, and I think he mentioned it. Okay, so. so Enrico Fermi, one of like the head guy on the Manhattan Project on the science side of it, uh, was one of the last people who was capable as both an experimentalist and a theorist. Yeah, and he came up with this idea for what were called Fermi problems, and his canonical example was how many piano tuners are there in Chicago, because that's where he was living at the time. And it's just one of these things, well, how often does a piano need to be tuned? Uh, how many people probably own pianos? And then you can just calculate all of these things to order of magnitude, and your final answer will probably be within an order of magnitude of the actual one. Which, if that's all you need, is useful. So, for example, when you're building the first nuclear reactor, hey, if this thing goes crazy, how long do we have to put the control rods back in before we turn Chicago into an extra extension of Lake Michigan? Yeah. And it turned out that the answer was a number of seconds. So instead of, or tens of seconds, I forget what exactly it was, but it was within human yelling and swing the axe reaction times. So the first emergency system on the first reactor was literally a bunch of control rods over it, held up by a rope, and a guy standing there with an ax in case things went wrong. <laughs> Which is why the SCRAM system for shutting down a reactor in an emergency is Safety Control Reactor Axe Man. Wow. Yes. <laughs> and obviously it worked because Chicago did not, did not turn into a crater. Uh, not on that one. Obviously, uh, things like Chernobyl, yes, <laughs> that has come up. But no, I think that one worked out OK. And obviously, when you're making reactors to, hey, let's turn uranium into plutonium, we should probably test this at some point, <laughs> just in case something does go wrong and we need to make sure that this works because we're building a bunch of these because we want to make a bunch of plutonium because hey, there's a Cold War on and we want to make 60,000 warheads for some reason. And yes, that is the rough number that both the United States and the Soviet Union built at slightly different dates. And then both sides kind of went, this is expensive and we don't need to make the rubble bounce that many times. So even in the 1970s, it's like, let's start dialing that back. Uh, any other questions? Real life, fandom? Cool sure. Um, so, uh, I did electrical engineering back in, back in undergrad. Okay, cool. Well, this, this might be kind of cool. Hope, hope no, let's hope not. Okay. Um, I have so, to teach 10 year olds tutoring so I can make anything exciting. Oh, okay. If I might, throw a, I might throw a Velociraptor in, but. <laughs> Okay, so tr as opposed to what other kind of electromagnetic wave? That's a very good question. It's been like four years. So. Okay, so I'm going to give the most basic answer to that. So an electromagnetic wave, most waves are something is waving, right? There's a medium and then a wave is just moving that medium around. So in the late 1890s, a couple of guys named Mickelson and Morley are like, okay, well, let's look for this stuff that's waving around in, with light. And they couldn't find it. So what you do is you take this thing called a, an interferometer and then, okay, let's look at it. We rotate it and since now we're going through this stuff in a different direction because the Earth is traveling through it, obviously, that should cause some shift in the pattern of the light interfering that you should see. So they move this thing and they're like, nope, that didn't happen. Well, maybe we didn't build a sensitive enough device. So eventually they got this thing to the point where 
uh, they had it sitting on like several tens or hundreds of pounds of mercury just to damp out any vibrations from the rest of the world and you can still rotate it because mercury is a liquid at room temperature and okay let's try this in January oop nope that didn't work well maybe by some magical coincidence the earth is moving right along with this stuff at that point in its orbit so let's try again in March still no hmm what's going on here so this is the 1890s. They just find, yeah, we measure the speed of light and it's just the same thing no matter where direction we're looking or how we're moving or whatever. And within a few years, Einstein's like, ah, yes, yeah, special relativity. That's how the universe actually works, not fixed space and time. <laughs> yeah, so that led to that. And so they kind of figured that just because waves have to be in something, right? Well, not electromagnetic ones. So actually a decade before that, a guy by the name of uh, Maxwell, James Clerk Maxwell in Scotland, took the four equations that you use to describe electromagnetic fields and from them went, hey, I can derive a wave equation. These two weird constants with a square root over them, that should be the speed e of this wave. Oh, let me calculate that out because, you know, he didn't have a calculator so it took him a while. Hey, that's the speed of light. Oh, oh, hello, this is interesting. And it turns out that what happens is, so you have, let's just take an electric field like in any of these wall sockets here, 120 volts AC. So it's going like this, so we have plus 120 and then negative 120, right? And it's doing that. So when it's not in a wire, so if you just have that in an antenna, for example, that's as you have a changing electric field, so we're changing the voltage, that's going to cause a magnetic field. Turns out a changing magnetic field will also cause a changing electric field. So these things just feed off of each other and they're perpendicular. So if you polarize light, so let's say in the vertical plane we have this electric field is going up and down and up and down, so now we have an antenna here that's being fed from this wall socket, so up and down, back and forth like this. Then transversely, that will be creating a magnetic field that's going like this. Oops, sorry about whacking the microphone. Like this, okay? And this is just a, well, a differential equation, second order, which means take two derivatives if you know what those are, and if you don't, I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards or in a minute <laughs> if you ask about it now. Um, and that causes a second order thing, acceleration basically in the magnetic field or vice versa. You can start with either one and wind up with the other, but electric fields are easier to do because it's easier to move electrons back and forth instead of in spinning them in circles often. So you just have this going back and forth and that's creating a magnetic field which goes this way and those just feed off of each other and will go through space for forever until they run into something. And what I was describing was vertically polarized light. If you have the electric field going this way, then that's horizontally polarized. So, and transverse just mean, so there are two kinds of waves in general. There's transverse and longitudinal. So transverse is the medium, or in this case, the field, is waving perpendicular to its direction of travel. Because if we have the antenna here, the wave's gonna go that way or really out in all directions unless we have, you know, a dish over here to direct it. And longitudinal is a wave that travels in the same direction as motion. You don't see that in water. Where we really see it is in the earth or a slinky. So let's take a slinky. You can make a nice sine wave with that or you can go dunk, and then you see this compressed bit traveling down. So that's a longitudinal wave. Did that answer your question for what a transverse wave is? Kind of, not yet. Okay. How can I help clarify that? Um, you, said, uh, you, said trans, you said the transverse wave is, when, is, uh, is the case when you, have the, when you have an electrode and a magnetic field feeding off of each other? Yes. Well, so any electromagnetic wave is that by definition. Oh, okay. So then what, so specifically, I guess, with, 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 within that, I guess, area, I guess, how, how does a transverse wave fit? Well, you said... 
So, so it's called a transverse wave simply because the electric field is going, is not traveling in the same direction, is not being changed in the same direction as motion. So you have an antenna, like let's just imagine a wire antenna, and then, so that's going to radiate around, but not so much out the tip, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're changing the electric field along the length of that antenna, so the wave is coming out to the sides mostly. And if you build a bunch of those, you could have a phased array. So the electric field is moving in a perpendicular direction to the way the wave is going to move. That's all transverse means, fundamentally. Yep. And one interesting, I'm going to go on a complete tangent here. Uh, they actually do interesting measurements on earthquakes with this because ground, you can have both transverse and longitudinal waves when you have an earthquake. Turns out the speed of those is different, so the different times that they arrive at the seismic stations helps you them figure out where that earthquake originated from. Well, the transverse wave has to travel along the surface of the Earth because, like, you're going through the core, like, there's nothing to bounce left up and down relative to it. It's just a solid mass in there. But that's where the longitudinal waves can go. So the transverse waves have to travel along the surface of the Earth when, oh, God, the whole planet's shaking up and down, and this is scary. So that gives you different distances and different speeds because they're also going through materials differently so you can see where this thing started and also learn things about what's in there. Next? Like, yeah, sure. Uh, I think time travel would be really cool, but the fact that we haven't been overrun by tourists from the future means it's highly unlikely to actually happen. <laughs> um, also, uh, so that was a flippant answer, and it deserves a bit more than that. Uh, in general relativity, you can actually go any which direction in time you want, in theory. Uh, it turns out that trying to actually engineer it requires you to have negative energy, which isn't actually a thing that we know how to make because energy is a scalar. It doesn't have direction, so it's always positive. So. Hypothetically, if you can come up with negative energy, you could like maybe make a wormhole and then do stuff, but it's, the, it's one of those things where we can write out math that makes that happen. Building it is, I'm pretty sure there are other laws of physics that say no, sorry. Um, but yes, it'd be super cool to just like go back to, oh, I don't know, the assassination of Julius Caesar, and hey, who stabbed him first? Or what were dinosaurs actually like? Like, what colors of feathers did a Tyrannosaurus have? That'd be fun. But the fact that, you know, we haven't caught any tourists from the future makes it unlikely that this works well, probably. I mean, given how poorly I would blend into, like, the 1950s, <laughs> Oh, yes, plenty. <laughs> computer, computer, as he's trying to talk to the mouse. Yeah, we ha don't see too much of that. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, I saw a hand, yes. So let's say I'm working with like middle schoolers. You have no interest in science. Middle schoolers, you said? Okay. Sure. I've, so, uh, okay, so if, so that's a very interesting question. So here's the thing, I actually kind of like Star Trek in that way, because the science doesn't resemble our universe very well at all when you, actually start thinking about and trying to drill down, which is unfortunate because it'd be really cool to live in Star Trek, right? <laughs> like, replicator, do this, and boom, I just transport myself there and warp drive wherever I want. Like, that'd be really fun. But at the same time, science is a thing that people care about and improve and work with. So there is that which I find very valuable in Star Trek. 
Um, if you want accurate science, so science fiction, Babylon 5 from the mid-90s I watched, their ships actually moved in ways that make sense, other than, you know, we have faster than light travel because why confine ourselves to our solar system, but, you know. Um, Firefly actually did not do a bad job on that, although it's also not very, as central to the story as, say, Star, it is in Star Trek. Um, I've heard very good things about, uh, what was that Matt Damon movie where he wound up on, stuck on Mars? The Martian. So I've heard very good things about that. I haven't seen it yet, so I can't comment. My dad watched that, and he has an agronomy degree, and so a lot of what happened, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but if you haven't, you know, he's trapped on Mars. He's got no supplies, so he's trying to like, grow plants. And there's just a lot of stuff in it that my dad seems to be very realistic. My dad has an agronomy degree and became a nuclear chemist. Oh, oh interesting. So, yeah, you would actually really enjoy it. I highly recommend it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Actually, uh, I don't know if you can convince your nephews or your middle schoolers to watch PBS, but they've done a very good job both recently and in previous years, and I think the BBC does as well on a lot of things. Um, I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer than that. I've spent a few years where either time or money were kind of scarce for movie going or TV watching. Oh, yes. There is a book called The Physics of Star Trek where uh, I've actually met the guy who wrote it. He came to talk at William & Mary when I was a graduate student there. And uh, it, he just says, okay, so there's this thing, and here's the closest we could actually do in the real world. And he just goes through that in detail. It's 10, 15 years old now, but Given that we're talking about things like transporters, the fact that we can't make them hasn't really changed much, so it's not terribly out of date either. Certainly, certainly not, maybe a little couple things around the margins, but nothing major. Um, and actually, uh, if you can get them to look into it, A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking, I th still think that that is kind of a gold standard of this is all of the cool stuff that we think might happen and we're trying to measure it. And nowadays, you're, those middle schoolers or nieces and nephews would be able to look up on the internet and go, oh yes, we actually have detected gravitational waves now because LIGO has done that and has seen a couple of black holes spiral in and collide with each other, which is super cool. Which is, which at the time he wrote that book was just a, I mean, there should be a thing we can measure eventually when we finish building the four kilometer by four kilometer devices in Louisiana and Washington State. Um, and there's only one equation in there. It's E equals MC squared, which isn't that difficult to understand if you want to. So, yeah. Uh, yes, in the back. Congratulations and condolences. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a degree in biology. Um, I like physics. Okay. Chemistry, but um, I don't remember much about physics and chemistry, but I did do biology. And um, a student asked me something that kind of stumped me. Um, so they were asking about light. Okay. How it works because I know that it, it's both a part of, it's supposed to be trapped in a particle and has weight, but then on top of that, um, they asked if light has mass. And I'm, I was confused because I, don't, I didn't think it has mass. So, ah, that's, this actually covers a lot of stuff. So, is light a particle or a wave? Yes, is the flippant answer, which is also correct, because it is one or the other. Getting it to behave like both at the same time doesn't work well. Um, I forget who it was, but there's some physicist who has a quote about, 
Yeah, God runs light on Maxwell's equations on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and the devil runs them on quantum mechanics Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. <laughs> and which, what gets really interesting about that is you can build a device, so you know what the double slit experiment is? No. Okay, so let's take a laser beam ideally, put it through two slits that are near each other, so you get wave fronts coming out from each of them, so you get this cool p line pattern on the wall behind it. Yeah. So, okay, so that's a wave thing, obviously, right? Yeah. So now let's put a photon detector around each of those slits. You're going to destroy it and you just get two lines of light. Mm -hmm. Now let's make this even more interesting. Let's take that photon detector away from the slits, let's just put it put a bunch of those on that back wall, and then only put one photon from that laser through the slits at a time. Okay? So you're only seeing one photon at a time. Over time, those will add up to that band pattern. Just because, oh my gosh, this is insane, but going through the slits is a wave thing, unless you're measuring each photon. And then measuring the photons on the end, well, that's okay. It doesn't matter where they are, we're just, oh, here's a photon, fine. We can do that separately. Now, so if light's a wave, no, definitely no mass. Photons are also massless. Okay. However, let's look at that E equals mc squared. They carry energy, right? Yeah. If we divide that by c squared, we can say, well, we've sort of got an equivalent mass if we need to calculate something that this photon has a mass for, okay. in case that comes up that actually doesn't have anything to do with black holes. What a black hole is, is you've had so much mass in one place that it scrunched itself down enough under gravity that the escape velocity for it, does everybody know what escape velocity is or should I explain that? Okay, so escape velocity is, let's pretend that you're on the surface of the earth, there's no atmosphere for drag on the rocket just to make our lives easier. You can run through this little calculation from Newton's stuff. You don't even need general relativity or anything from Einstein. And say, okay, how fast do I have to go to not fall back down? That's escape velocity. It's not even a particularly complicated equation unless square roots scare you. Um, so now what you do for a black hole is, okay, let's put the escape velocity at C calculate what that radius is for a particular mass, and if that mass is in a region smaller than that radius, light's not going to be able to get out of there. Because space-time is so curved that a photon comes in and it's just like, nope, I'm in orbit now. Or if it's even further in, it's just like, nope, I'm spiraling into the center. Yes, so that's, that's what a black hole is. Uh, it is technically a completely gravitationally collapsed quantum singularity. But the guy who was first describing these in the meeting in the 1960s went, okay, I've said that three times. I need a shorter word or I'm going to go nuts. So he came up with black hole for better or for worse. Um, yeah. Um, now, where do black holes come from? Any? So it's interesting, it depends on the mass of the star. Um, the mass of the sun up to, I forget the exact number, so please don't quote me on this, but about one and a half to three times the mass of the sun. Eventually, so right now, it's converting hydrogen into helium, and it does this through a really cool process where, okay, let's start with carbon-12, let's add protons to it until it's oxygen-16, and then a helium breaks off of that oxygen-16, and you have a carbon-12 again to start over with. Eventually, we're going to run out of hydrogen, or at least enough hydrogen in enough density to keep doing this. And that's when the thing is going to, well, it's going to stop shining for a little bit, sort of, because, hey, I'm not making any more energy. Oh, dear. So since all of that fusion energy is the only thing keeping it as a nice big giant ball of gas, it's going to gravitationally collapse because the sun is huge and massive. That's going to make it higher density and pressure, and then all of that helium is going to start combining into carbon-12 and oxygen-16, basically, and that's the red giant phase. So that's going on in the core. The outer shell will expand to about the radius 
orbital radius of the Earth. Uh, give or take, we're not sure exactly because, you know, we haven't run that experiment and it's not going to happen for four to five billion years, so we've got some time to deal with it until then, <laughs> uh, hopefully. Um, okay, so that's going to, so that's the red giant phase. Eventually we're going to run out of helium to turn into carbon-12 and oxygen. And at masses less than, again, I forget the exact number, one and a half to three times the mass of the sun, at that point, okay, we're done here. That's going to collapse into a giant dirty diamond. Mostly carbon, a lot of oxygen, some nitrogen, and that is a white dwarf. It's white because it's still really hot because, you know, it's been a freaking star, but it's a giant dirty diamond. It's just one big molecule. It's super dense because if you can imagine diamonds that are, you know, the mass of the sun, that's what you're looking at and it'll cool off eventually and then just be this chunk of messy carbon floating through space. Above that, something interesting happens, and that is the gravitational pull is actually stronger than the uh, quantum repulsion of the electrons in those oxygens and carbons, okay? So gravity is actually going to force those electrons into the protons in their atoms and turn those protons into neutrons. And when this happens with all of them, you get something called a neutron star. And I forget what exact masses those are. It's going to be like, well, whatever the top end of a white dwarf is to something 10 solar masses. I don't remember, know the number off the top of my head. You can probably find it on Wikipedia really easily. Um, and then above that, well, okay, so these neutrons, again, they quantum repel each other because uh, so, oh, so there are two kinds of quantum particles, bosons and fermions. Bosons are chill friends who get along with each other. They're photons. They flow through each other, no problem. Fermions are rugged individualists and do not like being li exactly like any other of their kind. So I'm already a neutron just like this guy. I am not going to occupy the same space. Unless we're over whatever masses it is. I'm going to say 10 solar masses for convenience. At which point gravity's like, eh, you think so? Yeah, scrunch, and then we get a black hole. At least a solar, a stellar mat, yeah, star, stellar mass black hole. There are huger ones in the centers of galaxies, but those are from like the Big Bang and just, yeah, there was just this much density here. It collapsed and boom, that it stuck. Except for, actually, does, so has everybody heard of, uh, oh shoot. Stephen Hawking, the guy who wrote A Brief History of Time? Okay, do you know what he's actually famous in the physics community for? He's done great things for popularizing it, but he's also well regarded among physicists. Does anybody know what he figured out? No? Okay, he figured out that black holes evaporate. So, here's the thing. So, um, let's go to Heisenberg uncertainty. Quantum mechanics, just a little bit. Um, error in measuring energy times error in measuring time is going to be greater than or equal to Planck's constant, h bar over two, over two, I think it is. h bar, basically. Order of magnitude wise h bar, okay? So you can measure the energy really, really well, but you're gonna take a long time to do it. Or you can measure something really quickly, but you're gonna have big, error bars, although since Planck's constant in meters, kilograms, and seconds is 10 to the minus 34, this doesn't affect us on a daily basis, obviously. You can flip that inequality and have just a particle-antiparticle pair with a little bit of energy appear for a very brief time, and then they'll collide again and disappear, okay? So as long as their total energy times the total time is less than h bar, no problem doesn't violate anything that we know of. And we've actually been able to measure that effect, believe it or not, because what they did, the, the experimentalists who did this must be absolutely amazing. They took two plates, big plates, got them really near each other. So the wavelengths, so there were only short wavelengths that were available in between those plates for these particle-antiparticle pairs to pop out in. Outside, you could have anything. So this actually resulted in a pressure pushing the plates together. 
and they were able to measure that. So this actually happened, and every once in a while, you know, this is going to happen near a black hole, and the antiparticle is going to get stuck in the black hole, and then the real particle's like, well, I don't have my partner to collide with again, so I guess I have to, like, slingshot off into space, and, well, the only thing nearby to steal the energy for that from is the black hole, so I'm a real particle now, and the black hole's slightly smaller. The antiparticle does, so it takes it part part of the black hole. <laughs> yeah, so you can look at it both quantum mechanically and gravitationally, and it works out the same way. And that's what Stephen Hawking figured out. Now, the interesting thing is, a smaller black hole is going to evaporate more quickly than a big one, so the one at the center of our galaxy, it's not gone anywhere. The ones that they were, might have been worried about making in the Large Hadron Collider, it'd go poof like that. No big deal. Yeah, so anybody want to build on that? Do you ha I know you had your hand raised. That has nothing to do with that. That's fine. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to see, like, are you familiar with fast travel and fallout and Skyrim? I know that they are video games. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you have already visited a place in one of those games, you can just do fast travel, like, oh, I'm going to bring the map up, and you just automatically get sent to that place, like, in a few seconds. Okay. So, So, in the game, how much game time is, like, quote, real time in the world of the game is going by when you do that? Um, depends on the place you're going to. I know it went from lifetime to, uh, I can't think of the one, it was the northern city on the other side. The name won't mean anything to yeah. me anyway. <laughs> it was like, you're basically on, like, the east coast, but you go all the way to the west coast. Okay. Okay, so like you'd say, I want to go here, and then three and a half days, like the clock in the game's going yeah, up. The game okay, so all that is is, um, you know, you've been there, you know the route. We're not going to make the player actually sit through their character going through that. So yeah, we'll just fast forward it. Okay. It's not actually teleportation or anything like that. Yeah, and you can fly from Baltimore to San Diego in four hours. Yeah, true, but you can really <laughs> Well, okay, so, <laughs> so, okay, yeah, yeah, um, so what could we do in real life? Obviously, there's flight. Uh, it turns out that there are problems with using supersonic transports over land because people don't like having sonic booms breaking their windows. Uh, weirdly enough, uh, I don't know, can't understand why. <laughs> um, obviously, road travel, that's going to be a bit difficult because how many people making how many different decisions are there on the road? Oh, God. <clears throat> but that said, uh, they do have high-speed rail systems in Japan and China, which they're getting up to like 200 miles an hour or more. So we could, in principle, do that if we wanted to. Elon Musk has the boring that he did. Oh, he boring company where he's trying to build that. He's digging a tunnel between like. We need to stop going this way with our roads, and we need to go, which is true. If you've been on the I 95, <laughs> Third dimension. Um, so there's that. Okay. Uh, one minute, please. Uh, let's see. So there's that. If you want an actual transporter like Star Trek, so it turns out you can't really do that in our universe. Uh, they. They came up with these clever things called Heisenberg compensators because that thing I told you about in inequality, that's also true for momentum and position. And you need to know both of those pretty well if you want to reconstruct somebody exactly accurately. So 
The transporter system in Star Trek has something called a Heisenberg compensator to deal with that. And how do they work? Very well, thank you, says the effects guy. Um, which, OK, that's cool. It, what you could actually do, technically, is you can get, so what they've actually done already is you can find a photon with characteristics that are exactly what you want, and you can eventually entangle that with another photon over here so that it eventually has exactly the same characteristics. And you can start doing that with more photons. Now, the problem with doing that with a, so an actual transporter would actually be a replication device. So instead of Thomas Riker being an aberration, that would be every darn time they use the thing. Um, the problem with that, of course, is there are how many billions of particles in a human body? How long would you be sitting in there? So there's that. Um, oh, actually, does anybody know why they invented the transporter for Star Trek in the first place anyway? So first season of Star Trek, the original series, you know, the ones with like all the cardboard props, <laughs> um, they did not have enough budget for a shuttle just prop. They didn't have enough budget for that. But making some like flashing lights on the film, that's easy. <laughs> so, so we'll film you there, we'll film you the same set without you there, and then we'll just kind of have you fade out with some flashing lights. So that's cheap. So that's why we have the transporter, which is basically the worst piece of technology breaking actual science in Star Trek and causes lots of hijinks. Oh, did they? I believe that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah, I, that perfectly makes sense, yes. So you had a question. Ooh. Um, any kind of technology that makes sense. Oh, well, hmm. Okay, okay, so something that, you know, we actually have an idea of how to build, although we might have to do some engineering on it. Okay. <laughs> um, hmm. That, how, how, how do we what? Well, I know one of my colleagues really likes the idea of getting a husky the dog for every husky the container that we have and just having the, and just having the Iditarod coming down I-95, but uh, th th I don't think that would be my preferred answer. Um, honestly, well, so the thing I actually looked into was 53-foot uh, trailers and uh, tractors and a tractor to pull them. Uh, honestly, if we could just containerize everything and get the uh, robotic container carriers from X Men Wolverine, the recent one, oh, just yeah. boom, done. Which, by the way, they keep talking about self driving cars. I'm like, I'm pretty sure the trucking industry, once something actually works, is going to be the first place that really takes off. <laughs> Especially since you can com combine that with hybrid and powertrain technology. And okay, so I know I'm about to go up a hill, so let's just burn that battery down and then on the way down, break it up again with, combined with GPS and just be much more energy efficient, which will save them in costs. And even if they have to have a human at the end to actually dock the thing, that's okay. That guy gets to go home at night instead of being on the road for a week at a time. He's a much happier worker and probably a much safer one. <laughs> oh. Oh, really? Yeah, so that's an interesting point is, okay, this kills jobs. On the other hand, it's a job that the companies are having a hard time finding people to do and objectively sucks compared to a lot of jobs available. So kind of the, so this is the age-old question of how do we transition from shitty but available jobs to good but 
not always there yet jobs, which is more of an economics thing than a physics thing, although I definitely thought about that some because recession. Um, <laughs> Yes, yes, there is that, and then how do we retrain or just say, congratulations, you get to retire now. It's okay, we have enough robots to take care of everything. Most of us can just sit in the beach. unemployment. It, I mean, we know we haven't developed this fully, but we know how to make that happen, right? 100% unemployment, like we could almost do that if we wanted to. Yes, but there are some people who are very invested in us not having that, so. A lot of truck, my, my ex-father-in-law is, well, he just, he just retired, but he was a truck driver. And so, they, while they're limited for hours on the road, what people don't realize is that. They have they, two sets of books. Well, no, no, not even that. They, um, they are only limited on hours on the road. And so, he would, he would get up at 2 in the morning, and he would, he would get a local route, um, so he would have to come home every night. But he would get up at two in the morning. He would drive to work. He would then he would then load his truck, mm. and then he would drive the truck, and then he would unload the truck, mm. and then he would drive it back to the office and go home at night. Yep. And so while so while he was lucky and he had he had a really good route, it was very local, very very. He only had to drive from um, about an hour from Philadelphia out to Philadelphia and back. So he had a really, really good route, really short route. But, I mean, some of these truck drivers, I, I know somebody whose husband is working 16-hour days. Okay. Did you have a question? I saw your hand oh, trying I, to... Oh, I heard something because I just thought of something based on the teleportation oh, that sure. talking about. Where you had said, um, like the um, Riker aberration. Uh, you know, on Star Trek, they don't really talk about it, but the, the idea is that it is still you. You just go from here to here. Yes. But in other um, fiction, such as Timeline by, um, I think it's Michael Crichton. Um, yes. And so it was a copy. So yes. <laughs> so that is destruction of the original by reading it and then recreating right. it. Yes. Which is, which is probably really what the, what the teleporter in Star Trek is. So my, my query is. But Star Trek's a nice universe, so we're not going to say right. that. <laughs> It'll depend on your universe and your technology, but in principle, certainly yes. If you've ever seen a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy, it's kind of ugly. On the other hand, you can take a PDF and print it out, and every time it'll be fine except for, you know, errors in the printer. So how good is your reading? How are you actually storing this information? You can do it either way. Well, and the other issue with especially living things like humans is I am not occupying the same body I was five minutes ago. Right. There are a lot of biological processes that have been happening, so that's probably going to trump any errors, transcription errors most of the time. I have a hunch the cancer rate among Starfleet officers is probably higher, except they have super technology, so it's just like, oh, you have cancer, here's your pill, done. Yeah. But no, yes. <laughs> 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 True. Um, yes? Uh, what is uh, all the news around puzzles and tension? Yes. Is that could, could you elaborate a bit? So I think I have some idea what you're talking about, but I need a little bit. I don't fully understand it. Oh, but, uh, do you have like a news article that you could just bring up here and show me? Okay, cool. So she's asking about Hubble tension, which cosmic conundrum, da 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 da, most beside that. Oh, yes, okay. 
Um, let me sir, see. Let me make sure I'm not lying to you. Yes. Okay. So we had the Big Bang. The universe expanded. Uh, if you've gone into more detail, there was actually an inflationary phase where the expansion was accelerating for a while. And then ever since, the universe's expansion has been slowing down, right? Well, so in about 1998, some folks, there's a special kind of supernova that they call a 1A that we're pretty sure, because scientists are amazing, um, is we have, most stars are actually in binary star systems. Ours is unusual in that we only have one star. So when one of those stars turns into a white dwarf before the other, one thing that might happen is it'll start sucking matter from the other one, and it'll start, and then it'll start clumping. And then eventually we've got enough stuff that's not burned up, all, not nuclear fused already, and enough mass of it that, hey, we can ignite. Boom. So it goes boom. And it turns out that with these supernova 1As, we think that's what's happening. Obviously, we haven't been able to observe one up close. But what they, we do know about a supernova 1A is that the slope of the line as it decreases is directly related to its in absolute initial brightness. So that means that we can measure how much it goes down, and we know how bright it was initially. And that's good because something that's really far away is obviously a lot less bright than something that's close up. But if we can measure that slope of that line, we know how bright it would be if it was at the same distance as this other one. So that makes these things what as astronomers call a standard candle. So OK, this one is this brightness. We know it's got to be, and it has that slope of the line. We know it has to be this far away. So supernova 1a, we can measure how far away they are from their brightness. Cool. The other thing we can do is we can measure redshift. So as things are moving away from us, light, the light waves basically get stretched out relative to what we would see if it was stationary. So that makes it look more red, because red has longer wavelength than blue. That's the only reason it's called that. If something's zooming towards us, it's called blue shifted. Um, so we can measure that too. And what Hubble, the dude, and the women who actually did these measurements that didn't get the credit <laughs> back in the 1920s noticed is, OK, the further away something is, the greater the redshift. So that's why we know that the universe was expanding. We didn't before that. Before that, it's just like, well, the universe is here. Has it always been? I mean, we can't tell that it hasn't been, so it must be. And now that's the first idea that we had that there might be a Big Bang. Um, so the universe is expanding. Cool. What they discovered about 1998 is let's start looking at these supernova 1As. and. They discovered that the closer ones are being redshifted more than some ones further away, which means that the acceleration of the universe is increasing again, which, but we thought it was going to explode and then just, okay, there's nothing but gravity, so it's going to collapse again, right? No, there's something else going on. What? <laughs> so it turns out that uh, we can see about 1% of the matter of the universe because it's in stars, so it's shining. There's 5% of the stuff in the universe is matter as we understand it. About 25 is something called dark matter, which helps hold galaxies together. And it's called dark matter because it doesn't shine light and, well, gravitationally acts like matter, and that's literally all we know about it. And then the remaining 70% is something called dark energy, which can actually make the universe expand again. Um, actually, it could be related to those particle-antiparticle pairs popping in and out, but it can't be exactly because if you run through the math on just from quantum mechanics on those, you get an expansion rate which is 120 orders of magnitude higher than what we actually see, also known as we could never leave this room because that door is getting away from us too quickly. Obviously, that's not a thing. So. For the longest time, physicists were just like, well, we're pretty sure that something we'll figure out what it is eventually cancels that. But now we've seen these supernovas that, OK, so the closer ones are running away from us faster than the further ones, but only kind of within the past billion years or so. What? So that's what's going on. The universe appears to be, expansion rate appears to be increasing again. 
And it's just kind of like, oh, uh, well, let's put a name on our ignorance. Dark energy. <laughs> Done. Now we have a thing to call it, and we can start trying to do research somehow. Did that answer your question? OK. Yes? Uh, so, no. A quasar we now think is an early proto-galaxy. So it's all of this gas collapsing in on that central black hole, so it's colliding with stuff, so therefore it's very shiny. Because when things collide, well, like that's colliding, it's emitting sound. When particles in space collide, obviously space is mostly empty, so you can't hear anything. So it emits light. So that's why quasars are very shiny, and we're pretty sure that they are basically proto-galaxies. And what is a hypernova exactly again? Sometimes I hear that term, and I don't remember all the difference. So nova technically goes back to Latin, and it means new star. We've since discovered that that means something is going boom um, for various reasons. And uh, I don't know exactly what a hypernova would be off the top of my head. Let me see if I can look up something quick. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so that appears to be, so there's a nova, which is a new star, which is probably just the birth of a white dwarf, maybe. Uh, there's supernova, which is something really bright, because supernova, okay, let's make it brighter. And then hypernova is also called a superluminous supernova, so another order of magnitude. Because we've got lots of stars that are certain sizes that we know about, so like something our sun-sized, probably is going to form a supernova someday when it quits being a red giant. Something that's barely out of the brown dwarf stage, that would just be a nova, which, okay, we didn't see the brown dwarf, but we saw that thing as it died. Uh, Betelgeuse, which is that insanely huge blue giant thing, when that <laughs> eventually dies, that'll probably be a hypernova or superluminous supernova, because there's just so much stuff, it's going to be insanely bright. Yes, yes. That's actually a, one of the more interesting nebulas that the Hubble took a photograph of, I believe, too. But yeah, Beetlejuice is a long time. Yes, <laughs> yes. All right, um, so we're in a spacecraft uh, right outside of a black hole. We have okay. a pair that's uh, entangled. Okay. We toss one into this black hole, and then okay. we take the other one. How will we ever find out? <laughs> so that's, oh, God. So entanglement says probably, but it doesn't matter because we're never going to be able to do anything with that. Just shift Alice that particle now, assuming she survives through that goal. OK, how, is that, how are we going to contact Alice? It's just that problem. You can keep stacking turtles on it, but. So were, could they have been at some point? Yes. We can entangle two photons. But if we do something to this one, they're no longer entangled. So if something happens to one of these black holes, they're not necessarily entangled anymore. It kind of depends on how large of an effect. Um, but so yeah. Okay. It, I'm sorry. So yeah is not a great way to say things. But so you can entangle in particles. But when the outside world starts interfering with them, they're no longer entangled. Basically. You can ruin that very quickly and very easily, basically. So yeah, the setups for those entangling experiments, 
you have to pump the oxygen out. They have to be, well, the air out. They have to be really cold so that there's no thermal noise. All of this stuff that makes it really hard to do anything with. Um, that said, I do have a friend who is trying to commercially build single photon detectors basically so that you can transmit information securely because if you can detect one photon, if that photon never arrives, okay, somebody intercepted it, but that doesn't mean they have your message because every photon you get is part of your message. So, and he's trying to commercialize this and yeah, he has to have liquid helium in his lab, which is four Kelvin. Because that's how that works. Because these things actually work on uh, superconductivity and when the one photon hits it, it heats up enough that it's no longer superconductive and that makes it measurable. <laughs> yeah, which is really cool. His big challenge is making these so that, you know, you can get a couple of the workers in the overalls just <laughs> attaching them and it's not a big deal as opposed to needing a PhD in a lab with like clean gloves and stuff. Yes? I've heard that he has been able to make matter less than zero Kelvin, so do you, do you have any info on that? I have not heard of that. <laughs> do you have a reference for me to look no, at? No. Oh, so the definition of Kelvin degrees is that zero is absolute zero where there is no energy. There's no nothing. Um, so I'm highly skeptical on that, although if your friend has managed to do that, have him talk to you so that we can start do it building the time machine. <laughs> um, the, and actually figuring out where absolute zero is is surprisingly, it's not stupidly easy, but it's not that difficult. I did this lab when I was in grad school with some undergraduates. We got four baths, no, three baths. Nope, four. We had liquid nitrogen, which is at 77 Kelvin, uh, we had dry ice under alcohol so that we still had a liquid to put this thing in. We had ice water and we had boiling water. And all you do is you put helium, because it's as close to an ideal gas as we can actually get a hold of, into this pressure gauge, dump the bulb of it in each of these in turn, and you want to go from cold to hot, because if you start from hot to cold, well, you'll have still have some a layer of water when you get into the ice. Uh, basically the uh, dry ice temperature bath and that will form an insulating layer and screw up your measurement. So you can measure what the pressure is at each of these, then you can either pump in some more helium or let some out, do this a couple of times, see where the intercept point is on all of these and boom, that will be absolute zero and it works amazingly well. And with really simple equipment other than, you know, dry ice and liquid nitrogen are a little harder to come outside of a science building, but I'm sure there are high schools, especially in this region, that have those things. And dry ice in particular is not bad to make. You get a big old cylinder of carbon dioxide and you let it expand really quickly into this just box that you can then unlatch and here's your chunk of dry ice and don't touch it with your bare fingers if you, unless you want severe frostbite instantly. Or that, yes. <laughs> Yeah, cool. So you could get three of these data points on each of these and easily. And the reason we put it in, and the reason we put the dry ice in the alcohol is so that uh, we just have something to dip the bulb of the pressure gauge into. And technically we are, we are past time, so if anybody wants to ask me anything on our way out, feel free. Yeah. Thank you very much. This was fun.